Thank you every one of you for being here for Nathaniel Capsule confirmation of candidate presentation. Uh, as you probably all know by now, Nate is here from the US to work on one of our big ARC grants uh, where we look at physical activities and psychological well-being among kids with intellectual disability. And we were very lucky to have a PhD student who wanted to come to work with us uh, with a dual background in psychology and uh, sports science. Ooh. So it, he's taking a, a part of the project about sports science and physical activity. And it will be, I think, very interesting. So I'll shut up now and <laughs> do his presentation. So first I want to say thank, thank you to all of you for coming. I appreciate every single one of you. Um, and I also want to thank my supervisors for Alex and Chris for getting me to this point. Pretty awesome. I feel lucky to be here. So, let's get started. You guys may have heard this before, but physical activity is important. <laughs> I'm going to tell you why. Physical activity is important. It's important for living. Physical inactivity is a leading risk factor for early death. Pretty serious. Um, physical, physical activity is also important uh, because it's associated with a lot of significant um, physiological, psychological, and social benefits. Um, and that's not me saying this. This is the World Health Organization. Um, and they make these statements, and they actually made physical activity a priority. For, for help. Cool. So if you want to know more about you know the importance of physical activity and the um, you know the benefits of it for yourself or for you know the general population come to one of my lifting classes. <laughs> I'll teach you all about it. <laughs> no well it's in it's in the city so that's when you had a haircut. Okay, look, I promise I'm not here to lecture you all about, oh, you need to exercise more, you need to do this, you need to do that, that's not what I'm doing. Okay, I promise. What I'm here to do is I'm here to tell you a sad story. Uh-oh. <laughs> what happened? No? Okay, cool. Four-fifths of adolescents don't get the recommended, um, recommended physical activity. Okay, 80% if, you, if you're not that good at math, it's real large. So. <laughs> um, and on top of that, the least active adolescents, as they get older, they become less active. So you start down here and you keep going down. Okay, that's not a good, that's a sad story. Okay. Unfortunately, there is a group within this adolescent population that is even less fortunate, okay? And that's adolescents with intellectual disability. Compared to typically developing adolescents, adolescents with an intellectual disability are less fit, they're more sedentary, they're typically um, more overweight or obese, okay? And because of their, due to their limited um, cognitive abilities and social skills, um, they're usually limited in their opportunities to be physically active, okay? Um, Usually when they are able to be physically active, it is in an organized um, sports set, okay? Which is what I'll be focusing on, organized sport participation. Make sense? Cool. So I know you all are probably thinking, sitting there thinking, look, this is not acceptable. We need great, awesome interventions to get these kids active, get these kids moving so that they can have um, positive, more positive well, you got to slow down a little bit because, unfortunately, the research regarding sport participation among kids with adolescents with intellectual disability 
it's limited. Okay, it's limited um, sample size and just scope of research is limited. Okay, and here's some pretty pretty biting quotes about um, you know the the literature, the research involved in this. So that's what I'm here for. The uh, the title of my thesis is for participation for adolescents with an intellectual disability um, and an analysis of the outcomes of the conference. I'm Nate Capsule. This is my COC presentation. <laughs> so before I tell you about the, um, the my thesis and the breakdown of my thesis, what it's going to look like, first I want to tell you a little bit more about the, uh, the, the ARC funded grant and the project that Alex was talking about or that he mentioned. Um, it's titled Furthering Positive Futures for Children with Intellectual Disabilities, a Longitudinal Study, Investigation. It's a longitudinal investigation. Um, and basically what it's looking at is um, to be in the study, obviously you have to have an intellectual disability, okay, either mild or moderate, um, along with limited adaptive behavioral skills. Um, and they also need to be adolescents, so they're full-time students in secondary schools um, in Australia. Cool. And they can either, these, these, these participants, they can either be in, only in support unit classes or they can be in a combination of some mainstream and support unit classes. Okay? So this project that just finished its first year of um, data collection and ended up with 240 and allowed 240 participants, okay? As you can see, most of them are males, and uh, one percentage of them have, uh, are categorized as having mild levels of intellectual disability. Now for the good stuff, my thesis. Um, so the aim of my thesis is to basically better understand the role of sport participation uh, for adolescents with intellectual disability. Um, and I broke it down into two research questions. Okay, the first one is, what are the outcomes of sport participation for this population? And the second research question is, do the determinants of sport participation actually uh, predict sport participation in this population? Oh, and I made a little, I made a little chart um, or a little flow diagram to basically that's a visual representation in my head of what those uh, research questions look like. I'm, I'm not actually going to test this. It's not a model we're going to test or anything. It's just a visual representation. So, research question one: What are the outcomes? Um, first, we're going to look at it in two ways. First is systematic review. Second empirical testing of this wonderful model right here. Okay, as you can see on the left is uh, sport participation and that's measured by self-report from the participants. It's also measured by teacher report and by parent report and it's basically asking how many days a week um, do you participate in sport. Cool. And then on the right are the outcomes. And at the top we have physical fitness, which is um, measured by a battery of physical fitness tests. Um, pretty comprehensive tests. You know, or did things like um, ex explosive jumping power measured that, or hand grip strength, or balance. Um, there's a whole bunch of a whole bunch of tests in there. And if you want to know more about that, just just ask and I can tell you. Um, but moving on. Um, another outcome is BMI, body mass index, which is measured with it's a combination of height and weight. Um, and you can use that to categorize people into weight categories, weight statuses, I should say. Um, we also have symptoms of anxiety and symptoms of depression as outcomes. Now, these are uh, basically just wanting to know how do these kids feel? And how do they feel about um, their situation? And then finally we have um, 
physical self-concept as an outcome, and it's a uh, basically you want to know how do these kids feel about their uh, physical capabilities. Okay, and these last three here, symptoms of anxiety, symptoms of depression, and physical self-concept, they're measured with uh, self-report questionnaires that have been adapted to the cognitive levels of the participants. And if you want to know more about that, I can also show you, show you more about that or any of these. So, that was the outcomes. Oh, I'm sorry. i got to tell you about my hypothesis. So, I have a hypothesis. Sport participation will positively predict physical fitness and physical self-concept while negatively predicting symptoms of anxiety, symptoms of depression, be on my pretty straightforward makes sense. Now, moving on to research question two. Do the determinants, typical determinants of sport participation, do they predict, do they actually predict sport participation in this population? Here's the model. As you can see on the left, on the right is sport participation. And then on the left we have determinants, the determinants. And the barriers, um, it's important in this population, it's important to look at barriers in this population, adolescents with intellectual disabilities. It's um, because these kids, they, they typically are less autonomous than typically developing adolescents. So they're highly dependent on parents, teachers, caregivers, everybody else around them for support, for guidance, for anything else you can think of to be, participate in sport. Um, so barriers, barriers are a big deal. Um, and hypothesize that barriers will negatively predict sport participation. Make sense? So, we have barriers, possibility of barriers negatively predicting. We also need to look at um, drivers towards sport participation. And these drivers, um, the wonderful, outstanding self-determination theory, it, um, along with achievement goal theory, the awesomely wonderful achievement goal theory, they have been labeled as, or cited as, two important frameworks for looking at sport participation determinants of sport participation in this population. Okay. So intrinsic motives represents self-determination theory and basically we want to know do these kids enjoy sport? Are they having fun? They don't want to do it. They're interested in it. Achievement goal theory is represented by uh, a mastery orientation which is do these kids is, is their competence based on, um, I guess, based on how they, them comparing them to, them comparing themselves and their past previous performance, or are they basing their competence on the other kids around them? Okay, and if they're basing it on the typically developing adolescents, that could be, could be problem, problem, problems, problemful. Problematic. <laughs> Problematic, I got it. Um, so yeah, oh, and then I also have a sport confidence self-concept down here at the bottom. Now, got to control for sport confidence self-concept. Um, if we don't control for it in this, in this model, then um, a lot of the variance in sport participation probably be explained by sport confidence self-concept. So I want to make sure, I want to make sure we're just looking at the motives that drivers towards sport participation in this population. I noticed that in your two models you have essentially the same constructs, physical or sport self-concept, leading to sports participation and leading from sports participation. So you're sort of saying there's a reciprocal effect. So that I I would love to. I would love to, and 
going back to this model, I would love to say that there's a reciprocal effect and then it all, mm -hmm. that would be wonderful, but it's, uh, I don't know, that might be a little bit much for, yeah, I don't know, that would be cool though. Oh, and my hypothesis, hypothesis three. Intrinsic motives, endorsement of intrinsic motives, and mastery orientation will positively predict sort of participation when we control for sort of confidence of concept. Hypothesis three. Oh, going back. So, previous research has suggested that there is a link between the barriers and motives. There's a, you know, it suggests that there's a link between the two. Now, the um, well-respected researcher in exercise and sports site, Rod Dishman, he said in a review article that that relationship, that link, might actually be an interaction. They might, those two things might interact to predict participation in sport. So, that's what I would like to look at. This hypothesis four. Does, hypothesis four is, um, do intrinsic motives and mastery orientation, do they, would they be able to decrease the negative effects of the barriers between sport and sport participation? Okay, are the motives able to decrease the negative effects of the barriers? And again, we have to control for sport confidence, self-concept in this, in this situation. Um, and to my knowledge, this this moderation uh, hypothesis of, or this moderation model of motivation hasn't been tested in, in sport participation in any population. Uh, to my knowledge, it hasn't. So, it's a pretty exciting possibility. So, in conclusion, sport participation, physical activity, are important. Adolescents with an intellectual disability. Um, now it would be great to to have huge interventions, great, awesome interventions, comprehensive interventions that can get these kids more active, and participate more in sport. But first, we got to look at we got to build a knowledge base and the research that can that can lead, that can inform those interventions. Okay, so. That's what I'm hoping to do. Thanks, Daniel. Can, um, can I ask feedback questions? Or comments or concerns or suggestions? Uh, with the data, will you only have a single wave of data where everything's, so really all you're looking at is correlations? Well, it's, it is a longitudinal study. Depending on timing of it, you know, I guess it, it would be possible to look at it multiple ways. Because I mean, a lot of what you're, I mean, you've got arrows going in one direction, mm -hmm. but that's not really testable uh, with a single wave of data. Uh, uh, and it's not that, that uh, the correlations of themselves wouldn't be a valuable thing to look at to see what the, uh, uh, the but it's. Uh, undoubtedly, uh, sport participation is reciprocally related with lots of those uh, those sorts of things. It would be uh, it would be important, even if it's not an intervention, to be able to sort of test those out. Mm -hmm. um, were you here for Jesse's presentation? I couldn't sit here for an hour. I would have thrown up. I wanted to. I wanted to. Uh, 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 uh,
Um, but you haven't. But you were hypothesizing a barriers by motive, which motives is essentially a values. Mm -hmm. And so uh, there's a whole expectancy value theory that's uh, focused on the interaction between self-concept and values. So that uh, uh, that the uh, likelihood of participation will be enhanced if both of them are high, and if either of them is low, uh, uh, why bother? And that, yeah, and that, that is something I have looked at DBT. Yeah, so that would be a useful thing to build into the hypothesis and the literature review and so forth. I guess, I guess my question would be, where would the barriers fit into that? Uh, you can have uh, you, you can have more than one interaction with that. Oh, okay. You can have an interaction. So values may interact with both or either or neither. So the subscales of the barriers are access barriers and emotional cognitive barriers. Um, so we might actually be able to um, look at you know if certain types of barriers <coughs> or what what certain type what role certain types of barriers play in this. Do you think some sports have more or less barriers for this population? Like American football is really complicated. I mean. That's Whereas, like, yeah. uh, I don't know, catch might be obviously simpler. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, at this point, you know, we, we don't ask, we didn't ask about which specific sports, and I'm assuming that any sport is better than none. So anything you can, anything, any sport they can do, whether it's a, even an individual sport or you know something, it would be. But yeah, no, we have we we haven't looked specifically at that. It might have been uh, something that I missed, but I was curious about the specifics of how sport participation has been operationalized. Since they're self-reporting it, under what circumstance do they get to say, yes, I participated? What do they have to have done? Is it an the, inter... Uh, the, so how, like, how we're measuring sport participation uh -huh, basically yeah. is, um, so there's a table and it says, what days of the week did you, and over the last seven days did you participate in sport in school and outside of school. Okay, and could they have done five minutes uh, or like a whole hour? Is there, are there any specifics to their being able to say yes or no? Not to my knowledge. Okay. Um, but, yeah, I was I wondering if they might kind of learn that it might be uh, encouraging for them to say yes, even if they have kind of done 30 seconds versus 30 minutes of physical activity, if they might say, yes, I did participate, if there weren't any constraints on that? Yeah, I have to go back and look at that. I imagine that could be, that could be an issue. Right. If we, how it was. Under what circumstances they get to say yes. Yeah. yeah. All of the questionnaires, all of the self-report questionnaires are completed with the help of research assistant and we right. really focus on sport participation. Uh -huh. So these kids will not say yes if they run if they run five minutes in the school. Uh -huh. It's really sport activity. Right. Okay. In an organized context okay. or physical education classes. So usually it's very good. Yeah. yeah. And as he said, the the sport participation we also have the same questions that are asked from the teachers and right. the parents and we'll come up with a way to get an aggregate measure. Right. Combine the two. Okay. Sure. Okay. Uh, so I was wondering whether you might look at um, the differences in the relationships between in-school and out-of-school activity. Um, because one of the one of the issues um, with in-school participation is that where the uh, typically developing kids are off playing baseball, uh, you know, basketball or whatever, uh, almost inevitably the kids with intellectual disability are playing, uh, doing ten ping pong, uh, which has limited, if any, physical activity uh, benefits. Outside of school, however, there's quite well developed, uh, you know, the um, Olympic stuff, and then the you know the South Coast Basketball Association and those kind of things. And so I'm wondering whether you might get quite different sets of results for in school and out of school. Whether that's 
We, uh, some of the early research that we were looking at uh, on the effects of, uh, of special education classes versus mainstreaming on uh, self-concept suggested that there were huge frame of reference effects uh, depending upon uh, whether the kids were in special classes or in mainstream classes. And, uh, and you're just, you're going to have a mix of that. You don't have a real good, you don't have a good um, control on that. But nevertheless, that you ought to include that as one of your background variables to look at in relation to that. Do you have kids that are completely in special education classes and completely in mainstream and mixed? Not completely mainstream. Huh? Not completely mainstream. Okay, so you've got completely. Uh, in special ed and mixed. And mixed. But I th the issue would be that we don't have a whole lot of combined. So mixed, we don't have a whole lot mm -hmm. of kids in that. Mm -hmm. Still so reasonable to include it as a control variable mm -hmm. and see if there's anything there. Cool. Following on um, uh, that comment by her, I just had a question about the mild and moderate um, intellectual disability about whether you perceive that there is some level at which participation is likely to be affected and whether you're going to consider that in the analysis. Between, okay, between mild and moderate. moderate. I think, I mean, that, that would be, you know, to look at basically a multi-level where you would look at, you know, how participation is affected by mild and moderate. Is that what you're saying? Right, just, it's a personal point because I've worked in group houses with people's intellectual disabilities mm -hmm. and, and I sort of noticed that participation in all sorts of things does vary in the severity of the intellectual disability. So I was just thinking, mm, mild and moderate, well, mild, sure, that'd be fine, but there's quite a bit of variability in the moderate group. Oh, yeah. we, first, we don't have any severe because they yeah. just can't yeah. answer the yeah. questions. Yeah. Uh, what we realize at the moment, the classification that he's using are the school-based classification into mild and moderate, but we're still collecting formal IQ tests from the school yeah, records and right. somewhere else. Yeah. But what we realize along the way in the instruction that we've given to schools after the pilot is that we mainly focus on the top range of moderate and on the top range of moderate without too much comorbidity. Yeah. Because that makes the answering too complex. Yeah, yeah. So it's the same thing with nonverbal kids. We do that we yeah. can't answer. So we have a couple of them yeah. where we're missing a lot of data, but we have parental uh, reports and teacher reports also. But it's mostly the top range of moderate. Okay. Cool. What makes that even more complicated is that uh, parents are gaming the system when it comes to IQ tests. Oh. So uh, the IQ test you get might be low, uh, but it's because the kid's been kept up all night on Red Bulls and, and whatever to uh, get a trip up. Uh, so it's hard to, oh, wow. it's hard to really believe that this. Yeah. Uh, Alex brought up the issue of comorbidity, and I was wondering, you know, so kids with uh, Down syndrome uh, often have hearing problems or, or whatnot. Mm -hmm. are, are you going to be looking at that, or have you deliberately selected out uh, comorbidity? We have the measurements, but we didn't select them out. So everything is there. We're going to look at it, but we just the data is just getting here. So, and that's also one of the answer to to her question about longitudinal data. Um, it, it's that it's year one, and Nate is one Nate is one year into his PhD, so. We want to do some longitudinal analysis, but it depends where he is at the moment where time two data can, comes in, so we don't know that yet. But in Jesse's thesis, there's a couple of very good cross-sectional studies with yeah. really complex predictive models. Mm -hmm. That could be reciprocal effects model also. Mm -hmm. I think it's amazing. Well, are you giving an index for the kind of mobility, like a severity index on the kind of mobility? That could be, yeah. could be easily used as just one score in yeah. as well. Can we get a combined score and it's, it, it's a colleague that we have that he's working yeah. with, we've got a colleague in the it's who's piloting a similar project in Canada. And we're, we're getting, trying to get some kind of measure of it, but... Okay, any more questions? Or we, 
we should congratulate you very much, Nathaniel, for coming coming all this way, or was the resident in Australia? I <laughs> He lives here now. Oh, you're with me now. Oh, you need to come here tonight. I came a long, a long way one year ago. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much. It's a very, uh, it's a very interesting topic, and I'm sure we'll be all uh, keen to hear how it goes. So, thank you all very much for coming too. Thank you.